Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to John chapter 4. And um, I've, been, I've been stuck in the book of John, but it's okay. And I'm really enjoying the word of the Lord and what God is um, putting into my spirit. Read two verses to you, John 4, verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, the true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, John has a perspective of more than a half a century of spirit-filled believers when he writes his book. He has more than any of the earlier Gospels. The other writers uh, wrote their books much sooner than John. And John, in his, in his book, talks a lot about the Spirit. He portrays the teachings, the ministry, the actions, the reactions of Jesus in a way that shows us how to live uh, a good life living for the Lord through the power of walking in the Spirit. We need to pay special attention to how John looks at a Spirit-filled life and and, and how he views that through his book. Jesus frequently spoke to the multitudes. He also spent considerable time in one-on-one situations. And you see that in the Gospel of John. And he reveals uh, the incident in John chapter 4 that I've read to you from this morning. He, he, he reveals this, um, this one-on-one appointments that he takes with people. He gives clear sense that he had divine appointments on a daily basis that, that, that the leading of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit would change people's lives. Jesus makes it a point to record, um, or John, excuse me, makes it a point to record this story. And if you looked at the story, you would say, you know, maybe this is not somewhere where Jesus should be in John chapter 4. See, G- John... John tells about Jesus going through Samaria. Samaria was not considered part of the Holy Land at the time because it was populated with a mixed race of of, of pagans. And and because of the ongoing hostilities between the Jews and the Samaritans, the the most common route was actually to take a longer way, cross the Jordan River, and bypass the, the area of Samaria, that territory, completely. But Jesus had an appointment. He had a divine appointment. And he, he points to um, this a- appointment by, by showing up at the well. And even the response of the lady, she says, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. They don't have any dealings. He reveals to the Samaritan woman that was living an immoral lifestyle, you could Look at all the strikes she had against her, but Jesus uh, had a divine appointment and he obviously loved her that her soul would be saved. One ancient Jewish proverb says, may I never set eyes on a Samaritan. This was how they thought, how they lived. Most Jewish men at the time started their day with thanking God that they were not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Seriously. The Hebrew man did not talk to women in public. That included his daughter and wife. And when you understand the culture, you understand what Jesus is dealing with, he has a divine appointment. And he even has such a divine appointment that he sends all the rest of the disciples away to buy food. There's something... That's going to happen in this appointment. And he makes this incredible request. Give me to drink. Jesus shatters all the religious barriers that held this woman back from 
any relationship with an almighty God. And he, he, he tears down those walls instantaneously by saying, give me a drink. She is first amazed that Jesus would even talk to her. Then intensely curious as to what he means when he says that he's going to offer her living water. The Greek language reveals that Jesus used two different verb tenses when he was talking about living water. You can see it in John chapter 4 verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh, this is, this tense is a sustained action. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh, this is a single act. Of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Uh, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You see the actions, this continual sustained action and one single moment of a divine appointment of God. Literally, whoever continues to drink of anything this world has to offer will thirst again. But whoever takes one drink of the water Jesus gives will never thirst again. I'm not talking about a natural water. I'm talking about the power of His Spirit. See, the things of the world never completely satisfy. There's always an, un, uh, uh, an unquenchable thirst remaining. In fact, one of the most vivid pictures uh, we have uh, uh, of hell is Jesus' parable of the rich man tormented in the flames crying out, I thirst. I thirst. Once again, Jesus reveals details to her of her life that could not possibly have been known by human means she realizes that and she speaks and says you must be a prophet she asked him one question that burned at the at the heart of the samaritan the heart of the samaritan jewish conflict she she says this what religion is right what kind of worship makes me right with God. We read that and we say, you know, that's, that seems just like a, a nice little question. This was a huge question to her. Because of the divide between her culture and the Jewish culture. The Samaritans only accepted the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. So they were missing all the, the later revelations of God that he had gave to his people. They didn't know about the wonderful forms of worship that David wrote about. They didn't have the exhortations of, of the prophets. They were missing huge portions of truth about how to have a relationship and how to serve God. But the Jews were... Just as bad because they had the entire revelation of the Old Testament Scripture. But their religion had become a formality. They had truth, but they were entirely lacking the heart of the spirit of a relationship with God. This morning, I want to talk to you about the balance of spirit and truth. The balance of spirit and truth. See, Jesus bypasses all controversy entirely by giving this anonymous woman the most important key to worship. And that was balance. Balance between spirit and truth. He tells her that the Father constantly seeks such worshipers that will worship Him in both spirit and truth. The verses that I read to you this morning, the hour cometh and now is. That means right now. When the true worshipers, the people who really mean what they're doing, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Why? Because He seeketh you and I to worship Him. He is a spirit and there's something about you and I worshiping Him in spirit and truth. So what does it mean to have balance? Well, the word balance means to 
be in equilibrium, to be equivalent, to arrange so that one set of elements exactly equals another, to equalize in weight or proportion, to bring into harmony. It implies the adjusting of two or more things that are contrary to each other so that they, even though they're opposed, they, no one outweighs one another. They're, they're both important and they're both necessary. I'll give you a scripture. Proverbs 11 and 1 says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Balance in life. Job 31 and 6, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. This is about both sides of the equation being equal. Daniel 5, 27, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. See, in life and in church, it's always easier to lean either to the right or to the left. The most difficult position is in the middle of the road. Because that's where you get hit by traffic coming from both ways. <laughs> Balance is not difficult, but it's necessary. I mean, it is difficult, but it's necessary. See, it's, it's all too easy to overemphasize some biblical principles at the expense of the equally important principles on the other side. I'll give you an example. The Bible instructs us to, for, like this. Be ready for the coming of the Lord. That's a good principle. And then he says, occupy until I come. That's a very important principle. <laughs> yeah, you need to be ready for the coming of the Lord, but you've got to live until he comes. See, that's the principle of both sides of balance. God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outside. That's why both are important. We are saved by faith, but faith without works is dead. This is the, this is the balance. God is a God of love, but He's also a God of justice. God loves us just the way we are. But He loves us too much to leave us there. Hear me this morning. It's the balance of serving God in spirit and in truth. See, unbalanced teaching is damaging because it creates unbalanced churches and unbalanced Christians. Nowhere is balance more important than in our individual and corporate worship of God. If we, if we do it the way He wants, we will please Him. And it's all about pleasing Him, not me. So I'm going to give you five ways this morning to balance in spirit and in truth. Why, why do we need it? Why is it important? Number one, God's truth strengthens the stakes. God's spirit Lengthens the cords. You say, well, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I'll give you scripture. Isaiah 54, verse 2. This is the idea behind evangelism. Reaching the lost. He says, enlarge the place of thy tent. And let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. When it comes to winning the lost and the world around us, there's got to be a balance in evangelism. If the church is going to grow, obviously we need to lengthen the cords. Make a bigger tent. Move into places where we haven't been before. Stretch beyond limits where we've never gone. That's absolutely crucial. But we must at the same time strengthen the stakes. Because the bigger the tent, the deeper the stakes have got to be to hold it from every wind of doctrine that comes blowing your way. 
The bigger the building, the greater the foundation. The higher up, the deeper down. If we're going to evangelize uh, our city, yes, open up the the, the sides wide open. But you got to keep truth uh, deep down inside. You can't change from uh, what it takes to be saved uh, and what it what it takes to keep you saved just to open up the tent you gotta drive the stakes down it still takes good old fashioned repentance it still takes being baptized in the name of Jesus and being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost drive the stakes down deep and open up the sides of the tent See, it's about balance. Well, Pastor, if you just do this and do that, it'd be a lot more people. It's not good enough to have people if there's no balance in their walk with God. And the opposite is also true. No good to have good old-fashioned doctrine down deep if you can't open the doors. It's not about me, myself, and I. A bigger tent with longer ropes must have stronger stakes. Or it will become the victim of strong winds. Number two, you okay? God's truth is a defensive weapon. God's spirit is an offensive weapon. See, the truth protects me. When the enemy advances against me, if you've been around me very long, you've heard me say, maybe once, maybe a hundred times, you never have to defend truth. Truth will defend itself. Psalm 91 and 4, he will cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Ephesians 6, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. See, God's truth is a defensive weapon. It'll protect you. You don't have to worry about whether it's going to last or it's going to get you through or, or whether it's going to decay. No, God's truth will remain whether I remain in it or not. His truth is settled. It's already, it's already there. It isn't changing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His truth is a defensive weapon. But the Spirit allows me to advance against the enemy. Look what Isaiah 61 and 1 says. The Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Let me tell you what the spirit is. It's offensive. It goes ahead. It advances. Zechariah 4 and 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It'll take you to where he wants you to go. Well, this is what it says. Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Let me tell you, the church doesn't need to be holding on. We're not holding on. No, 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 this is, you know, we're going to hold the fort. I'm not interested in holding the fort. The truth can defend itself. I'm going to hold on to truth, and I'm going to hold on to spirit, and I'm going to go to where God wants me to go in the realms of both truth and spirit. It's called the balance. Truth is my defense, and the spirit is my offense. It's when you don't have one of them that you get in trouble. I'm just a pond hockey player. Not very good at all. 
All the pond hockey players think they're good. Here's how it goes. You only play defense, you're never going to score. If you only play offense, you're going to let too many goals in. You play both. The good players always come back. The other players are always called cherry pickers. They're waiting up by the blue line. When you get 50 and over, that's where you wait. You can't, you can't make it all the way back and then back up again. God's truth is defensive. God's spirit is offensive. You've got to have balance. Well, I just want to feel good, Pastor. That won't get you through. That won't get you through. Well, you know what? This is the way it's been for 50 years, and I don't like those fast songs, and I don't like that foot tapping, and... And you'll just dry up and blow away. All truth, you dry up. All spirit, you blow up. Spirit and truth, you grow up. You got to have both. Okay, number three. God's truth brings death to the old man. But God's spirit brings life to the new man. See, it's a known fact that truth can kill. Have you ever been caught in this? You saw someone's new baby, and they asked you the question, isn't that a beautiful baby? And you don't think it's a beautiful baby? And have you ever been caught in the middle of that equation? This is an article. I, this is, that truth can hurt. This is an article in a women's magazine. It's not something I read. I just heard of it. <laughs> These are some questions that should never be asked to the husband. Ever. Number one, what are you thinking? See, the proper answer to that question, of course, is, I'm sorry, I've been pensive, dear. I'm just reflecting on what a warm, wonderful, caring, thoughtful, intelligent, beautiful woman you are and what a lucky guy I am to have met you. Obviously, that statement bears no resemblance to what the guy is really thinking. Could be thinking about hockey baseball, hunting, he actually may respond with the most incredible statement of nothing. It's not a question that should be asked. The question of, do you love me? The correct answer to that question is, yes, by all means. Those Guys that feel they need to add more elaborate words may say, yes, dear. But wrong answers would be something like, would it make you feel better if I said yes? Or it depends on what you mean by the word love. Those are wrong answers. Let me, let me put this one out here. This is a real bad one. Do not get caught in this one. Do I look fat? The correct male response to this question is confidently and emphatically state no. Of course not. Things like compared to what? That's not a good response. A little weight looks good on you. That's not good. In a small, a small western town, a minister was given a home baked pie by an elderly woman. He graciously accepted it and later on tried it with his family only to find out it was absolutely horrible. Try as they might, they could not stomach the goods. Of course, the next Sunday... 
the same elderly woman said, did you enjoy my pie? The minister panicked until suddenly inspiration hit him. Sister, as God is my witness, I can truly say that no pie like yours lasts long around our house. See, God brings truth and it brings death to the old man. But God's Spirit brings life to the new man. Look what Paul writes. Romans 7, 7. What shall we send then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said thou shalt not covet. See, the truth about me brings death to me. My old man must die when faced with what the Word of God says about sin. But then God gives me spirit that brings new life. He's not interested in just killing your flesh. He's also interested in you becoming a new person. Romans 8, 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 8 and 11, but if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. See, the balance of truth and spirit is truth lets me know what I got to fix and spirit gives me new life to go on listen I'm excited about good old fashioned teaching we need good old fashioned teaching but I'm also excited about last Sunday night when I just good old fashioned breakthrough you got to have both let spirit and truth become the balance of your life. See, God's truth gives me salvation, but God's Spirit gives me relationship. Listen to these verses. Ask yourself, what saves you? Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Even baptism doth also now save us. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. According to his mercy, he saved us. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved. The faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For we are saved by hope. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Thou com shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Which one of these things saves me? They all do. I'm saved when I obey the word of truth. It's an incredible thing. Salvation is happening because of the power of the word of God and the truth of his word. And I'm so thankful to be saved. But let me tell you what happened 40 some years ago is not good enough for today. I'm thankful for it, but it hasn't kept me this morning. What got me in the right mode of serving Him this morning was His Spirit. Truth gives me salvation. Spirit gives me relationship. 1 Timothy 2 and 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 10, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, you've got to have truth to get saved. But listen, if it was God's grace and mercy or love that saved us, the whole world would be saved. I have to obey God's word and apply salvation to my life. Truth saves me. 
But there's a lot of insecure saved people. Because their relationship with God is lacking. We can sit around and spit shine each other until the Lord comes. And be dead inside because of no spirit. Ah. Romans 8 and 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It's, it's, it's great to get saved. You've got to get saved. You should be saved. You must be saved. But you've got to have a relationship. Listen, the marriage certificate on the wall lets me know I'm married. But that doesn't make it a happy marriage. Someone was asked if they're happily married. He said, I'm happy and she's married. It doesn't work. You've got to have relationship. So it's about truth that saves you, but it's also about relationship that gives you life through his spirit. Oh, Let's, let's wind it down. Number five, God's truth gives me freedom, but God's spirit gives me liberty. Oh, got your seatbelts on? John 8 and 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, some people see God's truth as too restrictive. And confining. The question is, if Jesus came to set us free, then why does he have so many guidelines? That's the, that's, that's the question that always pops up. Why is there so many rules if he came to set us free? Well, you've got to have a balance of both. I'll give you an example. There's 206 bones in your body, unless you've had some removed. There's 206 bones in your body. They're like rules. They're rigid and inflexible. But God did not give you bones to restrict your movement. He gave you a skeleton to provide you with maximum mobility. Without your unyielding bones, your muscles would have nothing to work against. And you would be little more than a blob. Just a blob on the ground. What do you call a man with no arms, no legs in the swimming pool? Bob. That's the idea of freedom. Freedom means the absence of restraint, liberation from slavery. That's what truth does to me. But liberty goes beyond freedom. It means the power to choose. The wonderful thing about freedom is it gives me structure. But liberty allows me to flow in that structure. So truth brings me freedom. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing structure to my life. But what spirit does, it allows me to work in that freedom, in liberty. Oh, look what the scripture says. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Quite literally, God's truth frees me from sin, but God's Spirit helps me to enjoy my freedom. I just get all confused when people have all these questions about serving God. Well, I can't do this and I can't do that. What do you mean? You can do anything you want. I just choose not to. I choose to enjoy the liberty of the freedom God has given me. That'd be like, you got the freedom to come to church. Well, you come dredging in. 
another Sunday. Or you get the liberty of the freedom of coming to the house of God. I'm excited to be in God's house today. I couldn't wait to get to the house of God. Oh, the freedom says I could stay home. But the liberty tells me I'm going to come and enjoy the freedom I have in my walk with God. People get all caught up in, well, this and that. That's not, listen, you've got to have a balance. If you didn't have bones, you would just be Bob. But because you have bones, you're more than Bobby. You're Robert. Or, let me put it to you this way. Mere religion isn't much better than sin. They both kill. But a real relationship with God brings life and life more abundantly. There's nothing dreary about my walk with God. There's nothing dreary about your walk with God. You're balanced in both spirit and truth. Well, pastor, I'm not everywhere I need to be. You'll get there. Just keep the balance of both spirit and truth. Just just keep it balanced. I'm going to, to allow God's presence into my life, and I'm going to let His Word take out sin, and I'm going to enjoy the presence of the Lord, and I'm going to let His Word bring me closer to Him. This is all about having a balance of spirit and truth. One without the other, you will go into the ditch. I feel, I was praying about today. Maybe it's someone here, maybe it's someone watching online. You have question marks in your mind. I wonder about this, I wonder about that. Question marks happen to everybody. But you bring yourself back to the balance. You know, you may have someone say, oh, I, well, I really don't need a pastor. Well, it's not the pastor that saves you. But it is the pastor that prays for you, preaches to you, stands in the gap for you, stands on top of the wall and watches for you, prays between the porch and the altar, spare the people, Lord. That's what the pastor does do. Well, I don't really need the church. I can just do it my way. Well, for a period of time, that may be okay. And then you miss the family of God and the people of God and the rest of the body. It's kind of like, you know, just you only got one leg or. No, no, you need you need everybody. Well, you know what? I, you know, I don't have anything in common. Well, have you ever looked at your body? Your leg doesn't look like your arm. Your ear doesn't look like your nose. Like it's, it's, everything's different. Some people don't even have two ears to look the same. No, seriously. Everybody's, everybody's different, but it makes up the wonderful body that you are. It's the same with the church. So we're going to keep a balance of preaching the Word of God and the doctrine of the Word of God. But we're also going to keep a balance of a moving of the Spirit. There has to be both. Okay, I'm going to stop. Stand if you would.